by any number of different uh, reasons, uh, such as genetic and others, environmental, and that's true. In fact, a lot of stress is environmental. But few think that it's really an emotional or psychological condition that is really setting the tone and the environment, if you will, for illness, for physical illness, which is treated sometimes with radiation and chemotherapy and any number of different uh, psychiatric medications and the like. And today we have two wonderful individuals who will be exploring the subject with me to uh, uncover any number of different ways of dealing with this thing called stress and by even drilling down further to some deep existential and even ontological subjects uh, i.e. why are we alive and what is this thing all about Alfie you know so we can really get to the core of what this life is about and how that affects everything you could say from the core outward as though we were some kind of nuclear plant or something and uh, maybe we are and we'll be exploring all of that today in our uh, roundtable on stress management there will be some real takeaways for you as we speak with both of our guests and uh, as well as good books to uh, consult and learn more about so you can become more empowered in your own personal Personal lives for dealing with stress because this is something in our contemporary world everyone is facing in one way or another to a greater or lesser extent so uh, with that I'd love to welcome you both to the show glad to have you both on thank you thank you I'm gonna just uh, introduce everybody to you both yeah. and uh, we'll go from there uh, one of our guests is the author of Learning to Breathe, Priscilla Warner, My Year-Long Quest to Bring Calm to My Life. And uh, Priscilla is a very interesting woman. She used to be an advertising art director for many years, shooting commercials and ads from English muffins to diamond earrings. And I love this line, hyperventilating her way through all the client presentations. <laughs> yes, that's an honest statement. And uh, then she uh, wrote, she co-authored The Faith Club, which uh, became a New York Times bestseller and was touring the country on book tour for several years, popping different kinds of anti-anxiety drugs along the way before getting on stage in churches, synagogues, mosques, you name it, uh, her medication was her good friend. But at a certain moment, she decided, while flying in an airplane, that the time had come for her to discover her inner monk. And I like the way you put it. That became then the basis of this book, Learning to Breathe. So um, along with uh, Priscilla, and myself is Alan Locus, who is the founder and guiding teacher of the Community Meditation Center here in New York City. In fact, right here on the Upper West Side, he's the author of Patience, The Art of Peaceful Living and Pocket Peace, Effective Practices for Enlightened Living. He was selected as one of the 10 Buddhist teachers to follow on Twitter. What has happened to our world? <laughs> follow a Buddhist teacher on Twitter. <laughs> I wonder what the Buddha would have thought of that. You know? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny to think oh, about. <laughs> and uh, he has also, his writing has appeared in the New York Times, Tricycle Magazine, a wonderful Buddhist uh, publication, uh, where he also led a month-long online retreat through that magazine. He's written for the Huffington Post, BeliefNet, Backstage Newspaper, Positively Positive. Uh, on it goes. He has... Uh, taught extensively at the Berry Center for <coughs> Buddhist Studies of Vipassana Center up in Massachusetts at Columbia University Teachers Co College, Marymount, Albert Einstein College of Medicine, the Rubin Museum. His credentials go far and wide, the Open Center, Tibet House, and on. He's also been a speaker at the Rubin Museum of Arts annual brainwave event. Oh, I didn't even know it existed. I'm so glad. <laughs> I want to get my brain waves resonating with that event it sounds very good and he's also uh, taken many classes and has taught with such renowned known teachers as Sharon Salzberg uh, Berg Thich Nhat Hanh Joseph Goldstein and has attended many of the week-long events hosted by His Holiness the Dalai Lama so you know uh, 
I started studying Tibetan Buddhism back in the early 80s, quite honestly, with Kala Rinpoche and, to some extent, His Holiness, and uh, uh, Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche. And I'm just laughing at life because Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche used to say, there's no such thing as having a spiritual credential. <laughs> ah, nice. But yet, <laughs> this is quite a resume, you know. Anyway, thank you both for being here. And, My uh, pleasure. Really glad to be here. Thank you. Priscilla, sure. Uh, this book is amusing, it's full of anxiety, and it's also full of peace. Um, how is it that you came to write it? I mean, I know you've had a long history, actually. I mean, what could be called a, a chronic history of anxiety. And uh, you've tried everything, and you've used a lot of drugs, and, um, you know, you've really <clears throat> put yourself to it. I mean, it's, it's admirable. It's sad that you've had to suffer so much, but it's admirable where you've come with it. Can you just give us a little quick sketch of sure. your past and well, where it's What's the life you? I had? You know, I didn't know there was another one to be had. So now you grew up in Providence, I Rhode Island. I grew up in Providence, Rhode Island. Were your parents anxious? Um, that you my father knew of? was manic depressive. My mother suffered from depression, which I didn't really realize until I wrote this book and people from her past came into my life in magical ways. My father's twin brother was in and out of mental hospitals all his life, and it was very frightening to me. Mm. He was sort of my boogeyman, I say. You know, he had what were called nervous breakdowns that were whispered about behind closed doors. I was named after my father's favorite cousin, Priscilla, who um, had a breakdown and was schizophrenic and is probably, I don't know if she's alive today, homeless and schizophrenic. And mm -hmm. she used to send me letters. Um, she used to pick through the garbage and leave that in letters to me um, on my mother's doorstep. So I came from this family where there was a lot of pain and suffering, but it wasn't really talked about back then, but I could feel it all around me. So I had my first panic attack when I was 15 years old. I was a waitress at the Brown University cafeteria trying to meet boys because I went to an all-girls school. <laughs> and um, I was hoping they'd notice me. And then when I had this massive panic attack while I was dishing out peas, I was praying nobody noticed me. Dishing out peas? I remember it vividly. I was dishing <laughs> oh my. out. And you know, I had a polyester aqua um, <laughs> uniform with a little white collar, big spoon in that just giant industrial trays of peas. And I was dishing out peas to a line of very bored young men, I'm sure, and all of a sudden I felt my heart racing, my throat close up, um, my extremities tingling, cold sweat, and I felt like oh. I couldn't breathe. So. Did you see a guy that you liked? <laughs> That's very cute. You're the first one to ask me that. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> These things that happen. But that wouldn't bode well for the rest of my life, and I did end well, up having a lovely Well, we'd have to discuss that with your husband. With yes. No, <laughs> I don't think it was one particular boy. Okay. And in fact, actually... <clears throat> Maybe it was the stream of them, you know, Brown I mean, University, I think, Ivy League. Well, I've th thought about it a lot, and I yes, think that the whole world was coming at me, and that was sort of the most obvious picture of that happening. And there was a part of me that didn't want to break away from the home I grew up in, but here it was in front of me, this dazzling array of possibility. So a therapist said to me years later, you know, panic is a syndrome, so it comes from a variety of factors, and you have to understand panic in you. There's psychological, sociological, and biological. Mm -hmm. And she said, you have to go on, if you're going to go on this quest, you have to figure it out for yourself. So I... Um, I decided in the back of my mind, I'd had my eyes on these Tibetan monks who were meditating so effectively that their prefrontal cortexes were lighting up on MRIs. And I was touring <laughs> the country, you know, popping the I cloth. I love that, <laughs> that image. You know? Well, I say in the book, you know, they were plumped up like perfectly ripe peaches. Because, yes. And to me, you know, as a person who, and when you have a panic disorder, and six, mil six million Americans do, and yeah. 40 million Americans have an anxiety disorder. So you're always thinking, looking around you and thinking, okay, I'm going to a meeting. What do I have to do? And like, I had a flask filled with vodka, and I would self-medicate with that because it would soothe my lungs. What is your, are you, do you have Irish blood? I mean, that, that no, sound funny. No, I don't but think so, but <laughs> what, my what father often was asked if he was Irish. Um, Russian, Russian Jews. As Bell Ruth Naperstek, who's my wonderful friend and does mm. beautiful guided imagery, said, you know, we all go back to a shtetl, and, you know, there was yeah. all kinds of anxiety and angst you know with I the pogroms the, I wonder and we if all my had our family uh, belong to us. that same shtetl it's we all possible. belong to an original <laughs> shtetl i'm sure and anxiety is yeah. you know it, it manifests itself in different ways in different people oh, i've since means. spoken to people who said you know i had a panic attack i just didn't know what it was i, I didn't call didn't it didn't have that. a name for it yeah <clears throat> right right 
Anyway, so so that's what your heritage. No, I'm I'm really you know look, I'm <coughs> a therapist and then I'm incurable as such. So you know I always I feel look very comfortable at, with you. <laughs> oh good, good, good. Just relax. <laughs> uh, no, I, no I, and I, I always just look at the family line to yeah. see who's who and what's what because each thing right. presents a different. Uh, well, my brother, who is also Zeitgeist, a wonderful writer, a says mm -hmm. uh, we come from Jewish Gothic. <laughs> so dark, you know, not a lot of like, yeah. and, and, and in the course of writing this book, actually, once I learned how to sit still and how to be with my thoughts, and I learned how to ground myself with s some terrific therapies like EMDR and somatic experiencing, mm -hmm. then I was able to look at my life and myself in ways that I never could have examined my background before. And um, to come out on the other side of it with this incredible sense of peacefulness and calm. I was, you know, I had a wonderful Mother's Day um, and I was lying next to my husband in bed recently and I just thought, like, it, I could never have imagined that I would have achieved the kind of peace that I've achieved now. Oh. It's a wonderful feeling. That so. is. I mean, this has been a lifelong matter yeah. for you. Yeah. And uh, so but, you know, a lot it's of like people, you've come to the other side of it. Right. But a lot of people... You wouldn't necessarily know that if you'd known me when I was an art director or when I, I, mean, I had several different careers. And mm -hmm. a lot of the people who write to me say, you know, nobody would know from the outside because anxiety can cause you to accomplish a great deal. You can channel so much anxiety into many productive things. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely. So, but, but I'd it, rather live calm. Although once I once I actually I left my panic behind in this book, I, I missed it a great deal. I just thought, now, what if I am what I set out to be, which is like a serious monk, for God's sake? I, what happens to my sense of humor, my self-deprecating neurotic charm, I'd like to think of it as? <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, when you build an identity for yourself as an anxious person, and then you realize that the flip side of anxiety is a lot of depression, you have to examine Look at Woody stuff. Allen. You know, and he, I think, uh, who, by the way, is one of my gurus, I have to say. Mm -hmm. And I'm not anxious. I'm very calm. I mean, I can turn on calm quickly. Nice. And I can also rev Mazel up. Mazel tov, as my people say. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> my people will speak to your people. Uh, and it's fun. I mean, but, but I, I'm not a typical anything. <laughs> so I don't fit into many categories at all. But um, I learned fairly early in my life, having started studying yoga when I was 14, nice. way many years ago, one of the first probably in this country, um, you know, in relatively recent history, you know, the 60s type of um, movement. Um, I think I got a handle on how to just drop down and drop in, Exactly. you know, and just leave my mind from the ordinary dualistic world. And I always go back, don't get me wrong, but that is a, it's like a muscle. Right. But for an anxious person, that's a frightening concept. You know, to drop out of your life is uh, what's underneath you. What is your safety net? Where do you go when you don't have that adrenaline pumping through your veins? It yes. oddly becomes a comforting presence. It's very yes. strange, but paradoxically, it's, right. it defines you. That becomes exactly. Now, you can still be relaxed and enjoy some good Jewish humor. Absolutely. That's I just wanted to make that. Yes. Point. Okay. Yes, good. Definitely. Good, I'm, good, good. I'm becoming funnier and funnier as I get more comfortable with being, if I say so myself, if I, as, <laughs> yeah, I, as right. I get more comfortable being calm. You sure, know? sure, sure, sure. I mean, I, it opens up a lot more material for you. <laughs> I hope so. And, but, you know, it, it is interesting because a lot of humor comes from a dark, painful place. Yeah. And I really, you know, before I wrote this book, I really enjoyed really raw memoirs that were painful. Mm -hmm. That and was now, the Faith Club, correct? I mean, uh, that, that was a, an honest memoir. It wasn't as, yeah. as raw as some of the memoirs that I really admire. I mean, but it was very painful, uh, very direct and very yes, honest. Yes, 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 yes. But um, now, I, um, it's not like I'm constantly watching Disney movies, but I'm a much lighter individual sure. so we'll see what happens now, there's a lot of value in what you're saying I believe and uh, the whole where humor originates and one of its main functions it's a psychosocial function to relieve stress and tension in an otherwise rather nutty world absolutely and uh, so it's it's highly functional and it needs to put its finger on on uh, difficult moments and points in our daily lives so it does ride a wave. Um, yeah, so we'll Very return well to put. this. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So thank you for that, and we'll we'll circle back around. Sure. I want to just touch base here with 
Alan because he's bringing this whole beautiful wave. Uh, Alan Locus's book is called Patience, and um, <laughs> I was uh, impatiently le leafing through it <laughs> <laughs> to prepare for the interview. <laughs> Can I say that? Sure. <laughs> but in fact, I'll tell you the truth, it actually very much, Alan, slowed me down, if I may say. I really found that you write with a really nice rhythm, and um, it's kind of a standard Buddhist <laughs> sequencing of thoughts well i thought it'd be m my uh, musical background <laughs> you know if there's a rhythm to the writing yeah. yes of course because you were a singer on broadway yes the pirates of penzance and all God. the way back to the original company of oliver oh, wow God. yeah that's what that's people so say cool. is somebody who was in the original company of oliver is still alive <laughs> isn't that amazing <laughs> no, but well I, I was at, i was the youngest adult so Okay. So it's Shoo. Yeah, right. <laughs> right, exactly. right. More, please. Yes, exactly. <laughs> oh, I'll never forget. Exactly. Actually, my family, we saw it at the Schubert Theater in Chicago. We lived out there briefly before moving back east. And, and I seem to meet major hundreds. major peace for my development. Right, right. I yeah. meet hundreds of people who tell me, oh, I was Fagan in high school, <laughs> and I was Nancy in junior <laughs> high school. So it uh, goes sure. way back. Your sure. voice wasn't this low when you were that young Did you it was this? like this no when i was <laughs> when i was in oliver i was i was an you adult was i was a voice. young adult just oh, out yeah. of school yeah and um i was saying my i really wanted to sing opera so yeah being employed on broadway having income and being able to study at the same time was great so are you a baritone uh, probably more as well as a baritone. buddhist you know Buddhist baritone, <laughs> bass, a, Buddh a Buddhist basso bass, Buddhist. A, basso, a basso Buddhist, a basso Buddhist, <laughs> I like it, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you can relax people just with yes. the sound of your voice. You know, it's yeah. Some, oh, someone said um, they listen to me and they just get so relaxed they can go right to sleep. So you know, I've done so much teaching and put so many people to sleep, and it's uh, <laughs> quite a resume. No, it's <laughs> very comforting. Good. It's very it comfortable. Is, is. Good. You must be very comfortable then here, right I smack am. in the middle of a therapist and an amazing human Buddhist. being on the other side of me with his voice. <laughs> this is great. This what is great. a sandwich. Really? Nice. Uh, truly. Um, but to say, uh, I think this is so important a subject, and I feel that you are exploring it, and I'm, I really look forward to hearing what you have to say here with our and to our audience of the kind of the quintessential importance of patience now we could say that also about love but if you don't have patience in love <laughs> you're going to have trouble oh yes so there's something truly fundamental in the subject that we all do a bit of a dance around i would say and i was uh, so surprised that this subject really hasn't been explored yeah you know i looked uh, to see what had been written about it there was Oh, maybe I shouldn't get too specific, but there was it's one okay. slim volume of a wonderful writer who I admire writing about what his grandmother had taught him about patience. I don't think the book is even a hundred pages, um, but no one seemed to have gone into depth to get a sense of what patience actually is. You know, we have a language that we use with patients that's totally inaccurate you think about what we say regularly we say um i've lost my patience that suggests that patience is some sort of a thing or commodity that you can lose and find yes and that's inaccurate and it's a significant inaccuracy because when we realize that patience and impatience are feelings then we get a sense of what we can actually do about this. I mean, looking for your patients that you dropped under the sofa is not going to do it. Right. But when you realize that impatience is a feeling, and if you start to practice a bit, you know, you both spoke a bit about mindfulness, um, which of course is a very in word right now, but even if you don't use that word, just the sense of awareness of when you start to feel that little jiggle in your innards and you'll know you'll know when it's happening you you can feel when a conversation is beginning to go in a direction that you know gets you a bit edgy or as Agitated. we say exactly someone is pushing your buttons 
if you look inside you can feel that you can feel that feeling arising now the question is what do you do about it and that's uh, you know that's how we explore um, becoming a more patient person Indeed. there are steps before that there are those steps that we were taught when we were children we were taught now just take a deep breath dear or count to ten or count to ten or count to a hundred which is it I, I think I ten, ten. But, but if you want to go to sleep go to a hundred actually one of my students said she taught her son to count to nine I was just wondering what the psychological <laughs> implications are going to be for that little yeah, fellow. Yeah. Anyway, but you see, once you get to the point where you are counting to ten or gritting your teeth or taking a dip, deep breath, you're already experiencing impatience. You're agitated. Uh -huh. You're uncomfortable. You're experiencing distress, stress, all the things that Priscilla is telling us that we really are better off if we don't experience. So how do we back up and get in touch with what's going on how do we develop some skills and some techniques that's what I wanted to explore in this book and yeah. uh, there's quite a bit of research involved but I think I ended I up with that. some actual skills that people can practice they're not very involved but you have to want to do them yes they're not just gonna happen you know I'd like to in a sense back up a little bit here because I see that there and of course I know because I'm a stress management consultant also uh, techniques that we can engage that will shift our neurophysiology you know we know that we have things that we can do and we all know what they are and we're gonna go into it you could say that's the phenomenological piece of it yes. that we see identify a problem anxiety or agitation impatience and then we set about to correct it in the present then there's the you could say the historical piece which is tracking this feeling of agitation or anxiety back to its roots and getting some sense you know and I was playfully inquiring about your background but in fact it's a very important inquiry so we can begin to see since we are but an amalgam of our past anyway some unusual hybrid um, it's really interesting to see who we got what tendencies from whether it's direct ancestral or from our peer group or you know environment and then in that way begin to relax into knowing it was only that it was only uncle bobby it was only you know murray you know and <clears throat> then we can disidentify with it you could say and that's not my anxiety that's not my agitation i learned that just as one piece. I, mm -hmm. Could you speak mm -hmm. to that, Alan? What? Well, no, I agree. There's, uh, we don't. I don't know that we know a whole lot about what's actually inherent within us. But it is interesting, as I was listening to Priscilla and thinking about my own background and that of a number of my teachers. Mm. It seems like we all grew up under the same roof. Really? My mother died when I was very young. My father was manic depressive and died in a forensic ward as we fortunately stopped him from killing someone, uh, but still spent his last 10 days in a forensic ward. Um, Don't tell me you're Russian Jewish also. I shouldn't tell you. <laughs> well, if you don't want me to tell you, I won't tell you. No, of course you I tell won't me tell anything. you. You'll figure it out for yourself. I'm getting concerned about my right. mishbucha. You know? That's right. That's right. Um, well, you know, uh, just tangent for a moment. You know that the Buddhist teachings that were brought here to the West mm -hmm. were essentially brought by Jewish people. Just think of the names. No accident. Sharon Salzberg, oh, Joseph, Joseph Goldstein. Goldstein. You don't think he was born Ram Das, do you? Oh, Nor Krishna Dr. Das. Dr. Albert. I mean, of I, I, I love KD, but he wasn't born Krishna Das. Um, sure. it, oh, I'm very aware of that. Is this all yeah. coincidental? Uh, you know, not at all. Right. Look at a Jew in the lotus, right? You right. know, and yeah, oh, absolutely. That's why we've termed the phrase Buddhist. Right. Yeah. Or Jubu. Or Jubu. <laughs> so what did I do? I went and pursued a, prof uh, a profession that is laden with anxiety, mm. getting up on the stage in front of thousands exactly. of people. Exactly. I wanted to ask about that. Auditioning. Yes. 
You know, we are sure everybody hates you, but they'll hire somebody. They're going to oh, hire somebody. Terrible. Might as well be me. Um, but I, I was fairly fortunate in doing that. Um, and I, as I look back, of course, I wasn't aware of it then, but um, auditions are very nerve wracking. Opening nights are nerve wracking. But you do three years worth of one Broadway show, it doesn't take that long before you become comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, but there is that background. Now, to live under the roof with my father had to really be something where I was taught about impatience. I mean, I don't remember ever having a conversation, and I'll, I'll, uh, I, I'll I identify a conversation as being one person says one sentence and another person says another sentence and I'll call just that a conversation never happened when my father spoke you didn't answer Gosh. Uh, so coming from that and then reaching a place where I, I would say I feel very calm comfortable every moment of every day no not at all I don't think that's uh, realistic mm -hmm. but being able to handle what the Buddhists love to call the vicissitudes of life uh, gain yes. and loss praise and blame or just essentially the ups and downs sure um, the duality of it all yeah exactly and bring that not to some baseline that never changes you know an equanimous state that right. that you lock into some that would be medium a, you know, mediocrity right no, you know it's not it Priscilla was alluding to something that would yes. just be dull and uninteresting <laughs> and I don't think that qualities like compassion patient love I don't think these are characterized by passivity I think they're all vital and alive and yes. energetic and I think they're the real stuff of life the other stuff that's so grounded in stress and turmoil that's kind of the stuff that we want to get away from and, and to let go yes how to do it of course is a matter of uh, actually unfortunately it's really a matter of each individual journey we have um, you know we have programs mindfulness-based stress reduction um, all of us are involved uh, we are anyway involved in programs that can be very helpful but you know the buddha made it very clear at the end of his life he said i've worked this out for myself you have to work it out for yourself exactly. here, here are some suggestions based on what i've learned but don't do any of this because i say so you have to try this for yourself that's a real teacher i spent this weekend as you were teaching this weekend i was taking a workshop with uh, a former buddhist monk named uh, yasuhiko genku kimura and he teaches something called authentic thinking it was fascinating and i've known you know yasuhiko for some years and we've been friends and he's been on the tv show as well and you know just looking at the whole subject of thinking from a Buddhist point of view is interesting because it's never thought to be a subject we're supposed to even though mindful leave alone the thoughts here is a former Buddhist monk saying let's think authentically from our deepest self because thoughts and thinking are one of the great gifts of life and when he entered the monastery at age 17 or 18 I believe it was his Zen teacher said to him this is all about questions it's all an inquiry yes I know nothing mm. don't come to me with <laughs> questions for answers from me but you can come with to me with your questions and if you have any good answers please tell me <laughs> well here's a question for both of you that I found interesting this was my initial research to learn something about patients I asked several thousand people by questionnaire two questions the first was under what circumstance or circumstances do you tend to lose your patience and what do you do about it so what do you think was by far the number one answer that people sent back to me 
under what circumstances do you tend to lose your patience? Or you can say for yourself. What, what I was going to say either waiting in line or Verizon. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say the post office or driving. Well, interestingly, that uh, each of those answers, I think, is um, a manifestation of the main answer, kind of a tributary. What people said most was, I tend to lose my patience with when loved I, ones when I feel I'm not being heard. Mm. Uh -huh. Or by extension, when I feel I'm not being seen. Yes. So what is it that you think is really happening when you're waiting online right. or when you're waiting in traffic? After all, if you're in your car, There's if all no those drivers in front of you realized you were there, they'd all get out of the way, wouldn't they? Surely. But, right, because after all. You're so special. I am the center of the universe. Now, they don't. I have to wait in this line. I have to wait for Verizon. I have to wait online at the supermarket. Exactly. But really, it, I thought it was it's extraordinary. It's not being heard or seen. When I feel I'm not being heard. Yeah. Which is really, uh, underneath that is I'm not being acknowledged. Absolutely. And then also people said, now this is the one... Th I think that we can do something about, I tend to lose my patience when I'm hungry. Mm. Well, this isn't rocket science. <laughs> Guess what you could do about that? Eat. Or, <laughs> I, I lose my patience, exactly, yeah. when I'm tired. Yeah. Now we can do two things, we can get a little bit more rest, or we can bring a sense of awareness or mindfulness to the fact that I'm tired. I'm entering into this important meeting with the managers and the bosses, and I'm a little tired. Maybe I need to be more alert and aware. So, in other words, acknowledging one's state for what it is, is the first step in either developing patience, but certainly reducing anxiety and coming to a state of greater balance and center. I would say absolutely. Could you speak Except, to that? I would say, as an anxious person. Yes. It was very hard. The first retreat I went to with Young Gay Minger Rinpoche, who was a fantastic teacher. Yeah, I love him. Who had panic attacks as a child. Yes. So he was in my heart right from the mm, beginning. Tibetan Buddhist monk. Yes. yes. Interesting. He was my man. That's something I mean, no one thinks about, right? Right. And when he yeah. first described at, at the retreat that I went to, his panic attacks, and he said, you know, I grew up in the Himalayas, beautiful mountains, blue skies, lovely parents, and still panic followed me like a shadow. Tears just ran down my cheeks. When you were talking about your background, I, I could cry. You know, it, there's so much pain and suffering in the world, but I had such an affinity for this man who had suffered the way I'd suffered in a completely different life. But he talked about meditating on your panic and meditating on emotions. And as a really panicky person who was popping clonopin at the ex monastery while I was at the retreat and calling my husband and whispering, saying, What have I gotten myself into? I'd already cashed the check for the book for the advance. Was this harebrained screen scheme going to work? <laughs> um, the notion of sitting with my feelings was absolutely terrifying. So for me, what was a terrific combination of healing in my book was the were these body-based therapies like Traeger therapy, somatic experiencing, mm -hmm. and EMDR, where you, in the hands of a skilled therapist, you learn how to literally sit with those feelings and to discharge the unpleasant sensations, physical sensations, that have been percolating in your body, in my case, for decades. You can't, I couldn't sit there and say, you know, you're anxious. I needed to feel where I was anxious in every part of my body. These therapies help you to slow everything way down so that you literally reprocess them. Bilateral stimulation of the left and right side of your brain, mm -hmm. which is EMDR, EMDR therapy, sure. which releases. It's just like somebody touched a little grain of sand in my brain. Sort Not of like Western acupuncture. Yeah. It's, it's a mysterious miracle to me. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't, I, I couldn't sit still with those really difficult feelings. And I'd love for you to tell how you help people to do that. Well, I also sat with Minjur Rinpoche. It was wonderful, and he was very young when I sat with him. I, he still is young. Um, and what you said, Priscilla, is really significant. He said, there I was in the peaceful Himalayas, beautiful surroundings, uh, and as you know, he came, comes from a family of great teachers. And what we see from that, it is not about what's going on around us. We think it is. We look at the person um, who is rude, who is abusive, who is obnoxious, and we say, 
ah, now if that person didn't do that, then I would be much more calm, I would be patient, I wouldn't go through anxiety. But what we see is it's not that. The only place our anxiety can exist is within us. The only place my impatience can exist is within me. Doesn't matter my efforts to change you and what you have said that triggers perhaps this impatience is totally irrelevant. If I'm going to become more patient, if I'm going to reduce stress, that's all done within me. And that's the first step. I, I actually start the first exercise that I ask people to do in this book is to sit down and ask themselves and ask them to do this for a week, just five minutes a day. Why do you want to do the work to become a more patient person? And essentially, don't pay attention to your first answers because they're going to be the surfacey one. My wife wants me to, the guys at the office say I'm impatient. That's not your reason. Those are other people's reasons. When you start to come to your reasons for wanting to become more patient, they're going to have some sting to them. They're not going to feel so good. Mm -hmm. They're going to be when you remember that two days ago, you really snapped at your four-year-old and you just you could see how frightened he became. <clears throat> and what did he do? He did what four-year-olds do. Tell him that he mustn't do that. We don't do that. It's not safe. It's not proper. But when you realize that you've gone so far beyond that with your impatience, and that stings and it has a little burn to it, then you're beginning to develop the motivation that's going to be necessary when you just don't have the determination to, you know, to deal with the fact that you slip up. And we do slip up. And that's painful. Of course, it's very human. Yeah. You know, there are so many approaches, and I, I so appreciate what you're saying there. Uh, we can also look at... Uh, the whole idea of extinguishing a behavior that we learned because on some level somewhere somehow we learn to react we think it's just our own I keep making this point point. and I what is the Sanskrit word for extinguish what nirvana mm. oh is that so that's, that's the right. direct uh, translation that's right Oh, interesting. Yeah. And and Good. we have, uh, yeah. I mean, if we know anything about Sanskrit, we have a yeah. sense, an impression of nirvana. Peacefulness, calm. It's not a place, by the way. It's not heaven no, no, or no. anything like that. It is the extinction of, the, of suffering. Technically, the right. extinction of suffering. Ultimately, if we, uh, if we um, are able to extinguish uh, all suffering within us, all of it completely, mm. uh, we have reached a nirvana. state. A, a largely, it's the absence of something. Yes. <laughs> That's really yeah. what it is. It's, it's uh, suffering has of been extinguished. The activity of compulsion, of obsession, of the things that we grab onto that ultimately cause a lot of suffering. Yeah. Just have to let everybody know that we are spending the hour with Alan Lucas, the author of Patience, The Art of Peaceful Living, and Priscilla Warner, the author of Learning to Breathe, and we're discussing stress, stress management, stress reduction, peace, peacefulness, and how to arrive in these delicious places and some of the causes they're in so we can all have a more peaceful life, but not from adding something on top of an already neurotic or anxious condition, but rather by getting underneath and freeing ourselves up from the current condition in which we all find ourselves. I think that's another very important point that I like to make to my clients, which is that what is going on in you, while unique in its own particular, you know, Baskin Robbins flavor, is also something that is very human. And we're all experiencing it almost all the time. And there are windows of opportunity to shift it. But please know, in this way, Priscilla, and maybe this way only, you're not unique. <laughs> so with, with a professional therapist and with Priscilla, who's done obviously a lot of uh, delving into this, I would be curious to know how, in, in your views, how much 
one can accomplish on one's own? How, how much progress oh. can I make on my own? Without the teachers and the therapists and the healers that I met, I, I couldn't have done a damn thing. I mean, you know, I, so it depends on what you mean by your own. This was a very solitary process for me. And I, I you know, I, when none of my friends meditate. My husband doesn't meditate, my kids. I was off on these adventures. Was that it considered odd to them the, from a cultural point no, of view? No, I mean, people, I told them what I was doing, and some people were more interested than other people, but it was really hard, you know, about two thirds of the way through, and people would say, So what's new? And I'd say, You know, you just. You're just going to have to read the book. I mean, even close friends. I was burrowing so, I was, yeah. the act of sitting still was bringing me so far deep inside of myself and my whole past and my whole narrative of who I was and other people's narratives of who I was that it was impossible for me to explain to people what had become of me. And fortunately, I got to write this book. So um, people say to me, you know, it's so honest and brave. And I, I, and I didn't, you know, what did you think when you set out to do it? Were you worried? And I thought, this was a need on my part. It was an extraordinary privilege to be able to be paid for having this incredible journey, adventure. Minjir is not here anymore. You know, he's wandering the Himalayas. So yeah. there was a part, in, 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 and he had been in my heart for a long time. So um, I, when I first did the, the, the proposal, I said, I'm going to, you know, study with the teachers that I've identified in the past. And he was the first most important person. And I Googled him, and he was coming to New York the day after my birthday. I was starting it from birthday to birthday. So, of course, that was perfect. And then I didn't, I'm happy that nobody told me that he had gone, I wouldn't, I don't know, wherever but he I, is. I wanna... Because I, I, when I first heard it, actually, I got very emotional because I thought it was so important to me that he appeared in my life when he did. So I, an answer, that's a long answer but to I your wanna, question that I could never have done this by I wanna, myself. I want to bring this back around because to me, doing it alone is actually not the most important thing. Or I don't even mean having a therapist, but rather um, that you engaged in a path. If you had known, let's just say, about meditation or I, another practice that I do is and teach people is uh, Tai Chi Chuan and Qi Kung. Uh, you could call them meditation in action, if you will. So you're already integrating the so-called outside world into a state that's more centered and relaxed. Would you have, do you think, struck out on the same path of suffering that you had or experienced the same path if you had had those as uh, choices in your life. You know, I've, I've, um, I try not to look back too much. I'm so bored with myself after this whole experience. <laughs> I can't even tell you. Um, I love meeting other people and hearing their stories. But I do look back occasionally when people ask me. And um, when I left after my first panic attack, and I, I called somebody at my house, and they came and picked me up, and I was really distraught. They called the family doctor, and he came over and paid a house call, which is what they did back then. And he took my vital signs and he said to me, you're just a little bit nervous. And he prescribed Librium, which is a tranquilizer and a pretty strong one, I think, which was unusual for a 15 year old back then. There was no Prozac, people weren't taking SSRIs. And, and I've thought to myself, what would have happened if that man had said to me, I'm gonna give you this meditation tape, guided imagery, because mm -hmm. Belle Ruth Napperstack, I, I, she was able to take me to a place before I even began this process. And I don't, I know, I don't have any anger towards him for for giving me the the medication that helped me so profoundly to function for many many years. But I have wondered, you know, if somebody had said to me, if you know, either one of you lovely men had been the person who paid a house call, and uh, you know, I was in acute pain, and I don't know what would have been a good medication for me, but it, I don't Medication or meditation? Both. You know? Funny how they're so yeah, similar. I talk about upping my meds now. <laughs> and mediation meds. besides. Yes, yes. Indeed, indeed. So, sure. um, you know, I, 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 I like to emphasize to people that, although I, you know, I had this opportunity to, to go and meet all these people personally and to, you know, to attend retreats and they all have books, they all have downloads, they all have CDs. It's so possible in this day and age to have almost the experience of being on retreat. And I always, I also talk to people about going on mini retreats. You know, I, I've thought about, you know, there's that message you can send in your email. Um, people automate a message, you know, I'm unable to respond to emails. Or mm -hmm. Sometimes I just want to say on retreat and the people who will get it will get it. And it could be retreat for 10 minutes or it could be retreat for the weekend. But I think it's really important to give yourselves that kind of retreat. And, and you really, 
I couldn't have done this alone, but I there's so many ways to be helped in this day and age. Having just come back from retreat last night, uh, I couldn't agree more. You know, there was, um, for me, a significant point here, because I have some concern. Um, I'm sure you both know uh, meditation is very in right now. It's hard to pick up a magazine or a newspaper without an ad for all that meditation will do for you, cure you of this illness, uh, cure you of that, you'll never go through this and that. Um, it's significant to me that meditation was never intended for anything like this. It happens to be, you know, I'll go to the other extreme, mm -hmm. I think if you just stop Yes. and sit down so I guess I'm saying to you know whoever wants to listen to this don't get frightened or thrown off by this word meditation this kind of ooey ooey stuff that comes from the East just think of stopping and sit down for five minutes mm -hmm. and what you're going to see is a change in what's going on within you um, so, of course, we live in um, a society and a, and a culture where things become commercialized very quickly. Uh, but the, the original goal, if there was such a thing as a goal uh, for meditation, was uh, really wisdom, to be able to see things more clearly. And out of that, um, a balance between wisdom and compassion, and ultimately to a state of being awake being more in touch with what's really going exactly. on. Exactly. But it does happen point. that if you just stop, just yeah. sit down. Don't meditate if that doesn't feel right. Just sit down and stop. Turn off the television, turn off the radio, turn off the cell phone, and let it be just you and the thoughts and feelings and sensations that are there, and know that you're okay with them, that you're absolutely safe. What you're really also suggesting here, Alan, is that meditation isn't a doing as much as it's simply a being. Absolutely. And that's a space that most people in our society know very little of. And as you also well put your finger on, this idea that we commodify everything. There is a commercial aspect to almost everything and I've well, I've been involved in this world for a long time quite honestly and I have watched from when I got my mantra in 1971 from TM you know mm. I have my mantra you know and what that cost I had to you know wash a lot of dishes in a French restaurant for a long time to pay for that mantra so I mean it it entered the West that way as a commodity but when you dig down deeper to the truer teachings of course you get what you're saying which is that this is about awareness this is about cultivation of wisdom and wakefulness this isn't about a cure to a disease that happens by the way on the way to wisdom <laughs> yeah I mean the research today is very clear and there's unanimous agreement and by the way among yes. researchers unanimous agreement this doesn't happen often but uh, we are being told that there is not an illness known that is not exacerbated by stress. That's right. So therefore, anything that reduces stress uh, at any is level good. is going to be beneficial. It is good, no yeah. question. I'd like to turn for a moment, Priscilla, to, uh, you know, you said that you were at Brown University, um, you know, giving away lots of peas. But it was very <laughs> funny that later on in your life, you had, uh, you fell in love with a neurophysiologist, a neuroscientist, yeah, oh, that's right. who, by the way, <laughs> had a relationship with peas. <laughs> You're the first person to point that out. That's brilliant. You forgot someone you fell in love with. Though. No, no, no. no I, I fell peas. in love with Andy Newberg. <laughs> and I said the reason I fell in love with him was because he's written several books about God and the brain. Sure. And he didn't like to eat peas as a uh, child. You and didn't his connect mother, the two. Not at all. Oh, his, my. Not at all. Oh. Thank you. Oh, it is my pleasure. What a day oh, for you, right? Yes. yes. It was a day of discovery. One of the I had while you were talking to. But, yeah, the pea thing, he said his mother, he didn't like peas, and his mother said to him, 
What about the poor other little peas on your plate that haven't been eaten? Won't they feel badly if you've eaten just some peas and not the others? And anyway, that was his first lesson in <laughs> so compassion. So go visit them in the stomach. So she goes right? to guilt to get him to eat his peas. Okay, well, it, it worked for him because it works. then it got, he, got, he became a very, he's a lovely human being. He became very compassionate. He said he used to worry about leaving his um, his glove, his what, baseball glove out on the front porch all night long, that it would be a, alone. Or the blocks, if he played with certain <laughs> blocks, he was worried that other blocks would feel left out. He generalized it. <laughs> but when you were describing that all you have to do is sit, when I was an art director in advertising, in the middle of a crazy day, and I know this happens, it's true for a lot of people, I would close my door, and I liked to work on the floor. I was kind of known for always, I'd have everything spread out around me. I didn't like a desk, and I think I always was looking to be grounded. So I think that natural, and people say to me, well, you know, I don't know, I was pacing. I'm like, pacing is a good thing. Pacing is walking meditation. There are all these mm -hmm. human responses that our body Correct. gives us that we don't see as such. Exactly. It's all a different frame. They're gifts. Exactly. Yeah. So if you would pick up on that thread, because the work of Dr. Richard Davidson and others relative to the role of... Um, uh, different kinds of neurochemicals released and meditation. You explore that in that wonderful chapter of yours, This is the Brain on Love. Yes. Well, I, um, I had this, as I said, I was making stuff up as I went along. So I had the good fortune, my editor knew Andy Newberg. When I said, I want to know Dr. Andrew Newberg, she said, oh, I know Andy. I did a book with him. So she gave me his email. He couldn't have been nicer. Everybody who I approached in this experience, all these renowned people, they just said, sure. And I, you know, I, Sharon Salzberg, I said, is it okay if I write about this experience I'm having? She said, sure. I said, do you want to know anything about me or anything? No. Do you want to see what I've written? No. So people were just, uh, you know, they, the path opened up to me. That's the wonderful thing is that the path does open up. It just does. You don't really have to necessarily do anything. But so, um, Andy, I called him, and um, he was very nice. And I said, I said, um, you know, I have this idea. I want to become a serene Tibetan monk, turn myself from neurotic Jew to serene Tibetan monk. So can you medit Can you scan my brain in the beginning, and then I'm going to have all these adventures, and then you'll scan it at the end of the book? And he said, No, I can't do that, Priscilla. That's not a scientific study. It can only be at the most, you know, twelve weeks, but probably an eight-week study. And he said, and and to have validity, you can't do anything else. You can't do EMDR therapy, which changes your brain. I was on that time. At In other that words, time, you needed to establish a baseline. Totally. I was taking a certain amount of clonopin, anti-anxiety medication at that time. I had to stay at the exact same dose. And he said to me, well, what meditation do you like the best? And at that point, I had just turned, been turned on to metta or loving kindness. And I said, I think I really like loving kindness. And he said, well, don't do any loving kindness meditation until you see me. And, um, you know, he did that first scan. Take and then, two in the morning and see me tomorrow. <laughs> and getting into an MRI machine in and of itself with a panic disorder was an interesting experience at sure. my alma mater, coincidentally, where I'd had most that of my Penn panic State, attacks. Huh? University of Pennsylvania. Yeah, 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 yeah. Penn State. Right, right. But he was able, the scans are in the book, and he talks much more, er much more eloquently than I do about the training effect that he can see by increased blood flow to certain parts of the brain. And my particular loving kindness meditation was interesting to him because different parts of the brain light up when you are, you know, developing compassion. So that was interesting. Too. Right, 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 exactly. So what we see is, of course, which is no surprise to us, that there are many physiological correlates to a mindfulness practice, awareness practice, vipassana, anything where we stop and we shift the consciousness and that we understand that for every single thought is uh, uh, an emotion and a biochemical substrate, if you will. We're just about out of time, but I realized there was a question, Alan, that I really wanted to ask you, which had to do with a subject you talk about in your book on anger and what is the role of anger from your point of view because that stress of course I say to people all the time you can have the greatest diet in the world you can be really high on vitamin C and E and all the great antioxidants but one flash of anger BAM it is evaporated so could you just speak in our last minute or two you're, about you're that? quoting Shanti Deva aren't you a single well, flash of anger destroys eons I, of s I never said kalpas <laughs> but <laughs> right. I had my own version of it yeah well Shanti Deva actually the eighth century Indian scholar um, in his major work the sixth chapter which is called Kanti which we translate as patience 
he doesn't even use the word patience until near the end of that chapter. He speaks immediately about anger. Mm -hmm. So he sees uh, a direct correlation between impatience and anger. Um, now, uh, early on, because I, I am uh, have been a student of Sharon Salzberg for years, we had a, an early on discussion about this, and she doesn't see it that way. She sees impatience uh, as something that arises when we're waiting online at the supermarket, or in Sharon's case, waiting online at the airport, because she's always in airports. Um, and anger is something that's quite different. Um, just briefly, the most significant thing is that these are both feelings. That's all they are. Don't characterize yourself by a feeling. You know, we go right to, I'm an angry person. No, you're someone who experiences so a feeling. Disidentify. That if it if it arises more often than you would like because it's not very pleasant to feel anger then you want to address that uh, on this retreat that i just came back from one of the things that we were speaking about is that anger and mindfulness cannot exist in the same moment oh, interesting, interesting. Yeah. Um, so if i'm going to be mindful i have left my feelings of anger even just for a moment to, to be able to take nice. a look at what's going Understood. on. Yeah. That's a very fine, mindful point to complete on today. Good. <laughs> so I want to thank you both for being with me today here and discussing these very important, I think, pertinent subjects to our life on society these days. So thank you both, Alan Logas and Priscilla Warner, for being here today. It's thank you, Mitchell. It was great. Great. So glad. Thank you. This is Mitchell J. Rabin for A Better World. Thanks so much for joining us. And visit us at our website where we also have a newsletter, a free newsletter, telling you about what we have on the air in a given week and also a blog talking about worldly subjects of one sort or another at www.abetterworld.tv. That's www.abetterworld.tv. And also remember the book Patience and Learning to Breathe. And uh, it's all on my website. Thanks so much for joining us and look forward to seeing you all next week. This is PRN.FM. Your source for progressive radio that makes a difference. Love, lust, and laughter. Wednesdays at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm your host, Dr. Diana Wiley, a board-certified sex therapist and a marriage and family therapist. Guests are interviewed, and we sometimes dispense advice to create a format that is both informative and entertaining. If you can't listen live, go to the archives and rate the show on iTunes. The Progressive Radio Network is moving forward, and we hope that you are coming with us. Are computers making us mutants? How does the Milky Way fit inside your brain? Are shamans the original superheroes? Join the inquiry with Eric Davis and Maja Dao on, on Expanding Minds. Mind. Each week we explore the cultures of consciousness with scholars and scientists, magicians and artists. It's good to have an open mind. But don't let your brains fall out. Expanding Mind, every Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And archived on the web at prn.fm. The Progressive Radio Network is moving forward. And, and we, we hope, hope you're, you're coming, coming with us. Hi, this is Mike Rupert, host of the Lifeboat Hour, the number one show on Progressive Radio Network right behind our founder, Gary Null. Join us every Sunday at 9 p.m. Eastern for a soulful gut check on the status of our troubled planet and what you can do to try and adapt to it. This is from a nightclub at the end of the world. In the midst of heavy discussion, we also bring you a special and unique musical message from my band, New White Trash, and other very special artists. You can find all of our shows in the PRN archives for convenient listening at prn.fm. The Progressive Radio Network is moving forward, and we hope you're coming with us. This is, this is prn.fm, giving you a daily progressive take on the world.
Hi everyone, I'm Gary Noll and I'd like to welcome you to a special presentation of the Progressive Commentary Hour. The theme, Vaccines. The questions for our panelists, are vaccines safe and effective? If so, what is the proof? Are vaccines not safe or effective and what is the proof? Do vaccines give us lifetime immunity? Is vaccination the same as immunization? I have assembled a panel. Each will have an opportunity to address these issues in whatever way they choose. I will not interrupt them as I believe in doing the commentary on the air approach, meaning this is a classroom. Let us all sit, take notes, and understand that these individuals, each of these are women doctors and scientists, has spent years investigating this in depth. They put their reputations on the line because they all offer legitimate challenges. We're going to begin with Dr. Sherry Tenpenny. She is a physician who incorporates integrative medicine into her practice for treating allergies and childhood illnesses and women's health issues. She also is a person who has spent a great deal of time looking at the politics around vaccines and the impact of vaccines on public health and their medical risks in children. She is the author of two books, Fowl, Bird Flu, It is not what you think and say no to vaccines, a resource guide for all ages. She will be followed by Dr. Nancy Banks. Dr. Banks is a board certified obstetrician and gynecologist at Harvard Medical School, and she has had 25 years of practice in this field. She also has an MBA and conducts cutting edge research in the history of medicine. So she is also the author of AIDS, Opium, and Diamonds, and Empire, the Deadly Virus of International Greed. She will be followed by Dr. Suzanne Humphreys, board-certified nephrologist and an internist practicing in Bangor, Maine. And after witnessing several of her patients developing kidney failure following last season's H1N1 and seasonal flu vaccines, she undertook an investigation that alighted her into vaccine serious risks. She now focuses on educating physicians and other public health officials on the truth behind vaccines. The program will conclude with Dr. Merrill Nass, NASS, board-certified physician in internal medicine, practicing at the Mount Desert Island Hospital in Bar Harbor, Maine. And she also runs a clinic treating patients of Gulf War syndrome, multiple chemical sensitivity, fibromyalgia, and chronic fatigue. She is regarded an expert in biological warfare and bioterrorism, which she has been investigating for over 20 years. And uh, she has testified on four separate occasions under oath before congressional committees. Now, our program. And again, I will not be interrupting our guest, as I want them to have every opportunity to take this discussion wherever they choose, providing that they are addressing the issues of, are vaccines safe? Are they effective? Are they not safe or effective? Lay out your case. Are vaccines the same as immunization? Because we call vaccines immunization. Are they indeed one and the same? What is the problem with natural immunization? What is the problem with all the vaccines? That is our story. Please join us now on the Progressive Commentary Hour. Welcome to our program, Dr. Tenpenny. My questions are simple. I will sit back with the audience and listen to your answers. Are vaccines safe and effective? If so, what proof do you have? Are they not safe or effective? If so, what is the proof? And discuss your experience with vaccines and the what you consider the myths or misinformation around them. The forum is yours. The whole issue of vaccine safety has been that we've always been told that vaccines are safe, but we've never really explored the other side are vaccines unsafe? Vaccine safety studies are short, they're inconclusive, they don't go on for a long period of time. All the studies are performed on children who are not ill, on no medications, and are by definition healthy. But once a vaccine is approved, it's been given to all children and all adults, even those who have been chronically sick and are on many different types of medications. So we really don't